Unfolding the eternal excellences, the hidden insights of the truth and the depth of the riches of wisdom and knowledge. The Bible says, I have cleansed thee by the word. I have not pointed to your weaknesses. He says, I have cleansed thee by the word. I have pointed to your strength. And this is your strength. That I am Christ in you, the hope of glory. The glory of freedom, the glimpses into eternity. The gospel is not supposed to be an assumption. It's not supposed to be just a mere presupposition. Truth is older than language. But the word of God is way deeper than any human language. And now, Apostle Grace hey, with the word. Teaching from Hebrews chapter 2, from the fifth verse. Now the Bible says, For unto the angels has he not put in subjection the world to come, whereof we speak. He says, for and to the angels has he not put in subjection the world to come, whereof we speak. What do we mean by the world to come? We're speaking about any moment after now. We're speaking about tomorrow. We're speaking about next week. We're speaking about next month. We're speaking about next year. We're speaking about next century. We're speaking about next decade. Anything that is in the realm of the world to come, the Bible says he has not subjected that world of the things to come unto the angelics. Okay? That means he's telling us that there are people, there are entities to which he has subjected the world to come. There are entities that own the world to come. There are entities that own tomorrow. There are entities that own next week. There are entities that own next month. There are entities that own next year. There are entities that own this decade and the next decade. There are entities that own the century. And he said, it's not to the angelics that he has subjected the worlds to come, the ages to come. There are entities God has given the worlds to come. And the worlds to come are subjected to them, are submitted to them. They have dominion over those worlds, those ages, those periods of time. And the verse 6 says, But one in a certain place testified, saying, What is man that thou art mindful of him, or the son of man that thou visitest him? What is man that thou art mindful of him, or the son of man that thou visitest him. And the next verse 7 says, But thou hast made him a little lower than the angels. You have made him a little lower than the angels, and thou crownest him with glory and honor, and didst set him over the works of thy hands. Wait a minute. You have made man lower than the angelics, crowned him with glory and honor, Yet you are saying that you have not subjected the worlds to come under the angelics. But yet Hebrews 2.7 would make you assume that man is lower than the angels. So if man is lower than the angels, and yet it's not to the angels that you subjected the world that is to come, who then did you subject the world that is to come? It's an interpretation issue, and that's something I want to explain to us today. Okay? When you read the Greek rendering, in fact, the amplified version of that verse speaks the exact Greek rendering. Okay? And in the Amplified Hebrews 2.7, it says, For some little time you have ranked him lower than and inferior to the angels. For some little time you have made, or you have ranked him lower and inferior to the angels. For some little time. What do we mean by for some little time? When you go through the Greek to study what he means by some little time, he's talking about the experience of the fall. Okay? When man fell, when Adam and Eve ate the forbidden fruit, and they fell, they were, but in that time of the hour, 
lower and inferior to the angelics. They were lower and inferior to the angelics. Yet they were crowned with glory and honor originally and set over the works of the hands of God. Okay? And that little time space only goes to the end of the Old Testament dispensation and the covenant of old. When Jesus Christ comes, okay, the coming of Jesus was to correct that order. The coming of the person of Christ was to correct that order, to restore man back to the place that God had originally planned man to be. And we're going to come to that later as we read. And verses 8 now tells us, Thou, the Bible says, has put all things in subjection under his feet, for in that he put all in subjection under him. The Bible says, he left nothing that is not put under him, but now, he says, we see not yet all things put under him. Okay? He says, thou has put all things in subjection under his feet, for in that he put all in subjection under him. He left nothing that is not put under him. There is nothing in the world that is not under man in the original idea of God. There is nothing that is not under man in the original idea of God. All things were made under man. In Genesis chapter 1 and verses 27, he says, God created man in his own image. And the Bible says, the image of God created him, male and female created them. And 28 says, and God blessed them. And God said unto them, be fruitful and multiply. He said unto them, be fruitful and multiply. He did not say, I wish you be fruitful and multiply. He said, he blessed them and said, be fruitful and multiply. That means the ultimate blessing to man set a divine command in man to be fruitful and to multiply. It's preset in the system of man. And he told him, and replenish the earth. That's the power of the blessing. It's a commanded blessing that gets into the person of this man that God has made and has to work. He told him, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. Heal the earth. Restore the earth. And he says, and subdue it. And subdue it. He doesn't be above it. Heal it and be above it. Be over it. Be Lord over it. I have trusted you with it. And he says, and you shall have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the earth, and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. He tells him, I have given you dominion. You were made to be above the earth. You were made for the earth to be subject to you and submitted to you. You were created to replenish the earth, to heal, the word there for replenish, to restore the earth in order. It's in the power of man to restore the earth. It's in the power of man to replenish the earth. It's in the power of man to subdue it, to command it, to be under his order. But when Adam and Eve fell, they did not only leave a certain place in God, but they fell from a certain understanding. Because Satan gave them a deceived understanding. For God that knoweth that the day that you eat of that fruit, your eyes shall be opened, and you shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eyes and desires to make one wife. The Bible says she took the fruit thereof and ate it. And from that day, man fell. 
That is why when God comes into the garden, he says, Adam, where are you? Where are you? Do you want to think, oh, God did not know where Adam was hiding or that he was trying to tell Adam that he didn't know? This is the heart of God bleeding with pain that man has left a certain place and order. And at that very hour, the fall of man threw him lower and inferior to the angelics. Because the angelics had not gone against the definitive order that was pre-configured in their nature to serve. So that particular hour, man fell and became inferior. Yet he was ordained for the world to be above yet he was given dominion he was given the power to replenish he was given the power to subdue the earth he was given the power to be fruitful in the earth and so when we go back to hebrews where we're reading he says thou crownest him with glory and honor and did set him over the works of thy hands in fact when you go back to the greek it sounds like although he made himself lower than the angelics. You had crowned him with glory and honor and had set him over the works of thy hands. That's the rendering of the Greek. Go study. Although he went for a little time and ranked lower and inferior to the angelics, you had crowned him with glory and honor and set him over the works of thy hands. Some people, when they read that verse, they think, huh, the angelics are superior. That is why you've had stories of people who say, oh, you know, I had a vision of an angel and I bow down to the angel. That's the setting that was in some men of God of old. And when they saw the angelics, they would bow down to the angelics. Because they were of a fallen nature. And now, in a new creation dispensation, God has given you the understanding that you are superior to the angelics and therefore you're not expected to bow to an angel when you get a vision of the angelic because they come to minister to the heirs of salvation they are ministers the bible says his servants are slims of fire and the angelics are as ministers to the heirs of salvation they are your ministers they are your ministers, they are ministering spirits to you who are heirs of salvation. They come to serve you. They come to bring messages to you. They come to instruct you as those that are serving a superior rank. That's who you are. When you're born again, when you become born again, you're no longer of the fallen nature. You're a new creation. The seed in you, the Bible says, is incorruptible, he said. That seed in you is incorruptible. It lives and abides forever. And because it is incorruptible, it can in no way go back to an inferior nature, an inferior rank from the angelics. That's why if you call legions of angels, they will come. If you summon angelics for your sake, they would come. Remember when they apprehend Jesus and they don't know who they are holding and what they are holding. He says, knowest not thou that I can summon 12 legions of angels right now and they will appear on my behalf. The Son of God gave his life. His life was not taken from him. No. There was a lot for him and available for him and the legions that were available for the Christ they are available for you too they are available for you too and so man is made higher than the angelics now because of the restoration which we have in Christ Jesus because of the reconciliation to God that we have in Christ Jesus and so when Jesus comes, he restores that order where there is a definitive command in your spirit to subdue the earth, to replenish the earth. Men around the world are praying. 
they pray. And they are right to pray against this pandemic that is sweeping the world. But I don't know whether they are praying as victims in the world or they are praying as men that have subdued the world. I'm talking of believers. I don't know whether they're praying as victims in the world or they are praying as men which were given authority over the world and the worlds to come, the ages to come. I don't know they are praying in the understanding that the worlds, the ills, the peers, the ages to come next week, next year, tomorrow, they are subject to them and they are ordained by God to respond to man. He said, you shall decree a thing and it shall be established. That's why I'm asking myself. Believers are praying across the world and we must be praying. Okay? Men ought to always pray and not deceive. And he tells us, be anxious about nothing. But with all prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be known and do God. Why does he use with thanksgiving? Because we already know the result of our prayer. We already know the end of our prayer. We already know what's going to happen. Philippians 4, 6, and the second verse of Philippians 4, he says, And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ. The message version of Philippians 4, 7, it says that before you know it, when you pray as a victor, he says, before you know it, before you know it, a sense of God's wholeness, Everything coming together for good will come and settle you down. It's wonderful what happens when Christ displaces worry at the center of your life. He says it will settle you down. Because believers think that God needs to settle this pandemic. Some believers think that God needs to settle this pandemic for them to settle. And if you think that way, you go to the order wrong. God is not going to settle stuff outside to settle us within. No. God is going to settle us within. And when he settles us within, he will settle the stuff outside. One day you read of a story of our Lord. When the wind was boisterous and they were in a sheep. And it was moving. The boat was being beaten. The tempest was roaring. And the storm wind and the waves were beating the sheep. And they were screaming out for life, each man thinking that that was the end of their life. And the Son of God, the Bible says, was asleep. The Bible says, on a pillow. And the Bible says, and they're walking. Now, I don't know about you, but it's practically impossible for wind boisterous to be hitting a sheep and it is shaking and you're sleeping. The Bible says the Son of God was sleeping. He wasn't awake. No, he wasn't just closing his eyes, almost falling asleep or coming out of sleep. No, the Son of God was deep asleep. <laughs> he was deep asleep. Understand this. Jesus was asleep in the biggest storm. Men were crying for their lives. He wasn't closing his eyes. The Bible didn't tell us that he was closing his eyes, that his body was awake, that his mind was awake. No, he was asleep. That means that the course of hell knew who not to trouble in the middle of the hour. It knew who not to trouble. But also, the mind that was preset in the Son of God, the attitude that was in the Son of God, could not let him wake up. Oh, God. I wish God will help us understand what I'm saying. The attitude, the mindset in the Son of God could not let him wake up. It could not let him wake up. There was no way he would awake because of a storm. No. 
And because his mind was that exercised, it had grace and power to sleep. Glory to God. Glory to God. It had power and authority to sleep. Jesus could sleep. May God exercise you. May God exercise your spirit. May God attune your mind to a place of peace and comfort in spite of what is happening in the world. Another experience also in the Gospels. The believers of Jesus locked themselves up in the building for the fear that they were going to be killed or lynched by the mob that was outside them. The doors were shut. The disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews. And the Bible tells us in John 20, 19, Jesus appeared in their presence, in the midst. And the Bible then says, he spread out his hands and said, peace be outside on the Jews that want to destroy my people. No, he came to them and said, peace be unto you. You have peace. You have peace. You settled. You come to order. You come to terms. You be aligned. God is not calling a believer to settle disease outside the world without being settled within him. Firstly, God requires the peace of the believer. He requires the settling down of the believer. He requires the rest of the believer. He says, we which have believed, the Bible says, have entered into rest. We do enter into rest. When you become a believer, you rest. Yes, the world is in tumult. The world is worried and scared. Yes, it is. But we are not. We are not. Oh, the world is saying you should fear. No, they should fear. But we are not afraid. Because we know who holds us. We know who is in us. He said, greater is he which is in you than he which is in the world. The world is so scared. The world is so worried. The world is in fret. It is in a fear like we have never seen before. And people are in their minds opening up to all sorts of possibility of what this could become. And suddenly, some believers are following it. They are restless. No, we know there's a pandemic in the world. We recognize that. And the world will do whatever it has to do. Because humanity will outlive this pandemic. We are praying through prayer and faith toward God, we will overthrow this. But while we are in that process, do not fret. God says, you have peace. You have peace. You find rest. That is why he says in Philippians 4, 7, in the message version, he says, that when you do this, before you know this, when you learn to pray a certain way, he says, the sense of God's holiness, uh, everything coming together for good, he says, will come and settle you down. That means we pray so our spirits can be settled. We pray so we can get back in control of ourselves. Because if we don't have control of ourselves, how can we have control over the world? If we cannot subdue ourselves, how can we subdue the world? If we cannot replenish our souls, how can we replenish the world? If we cannot have dominion of ourselves, how can we then have dominion over the world? Say amen. So that is what he's trying to tell us there. So we continue in Hebrews 2. So in verse 8, you've put all things in subjection under his feet. For in that he put all in subjection under him. And the Bible says, and he left nothing that is not put under him. There is nothing that is not under man. There is nothing that is not under man. There is nothing that is not under a believer. Now here we're talking about the regenerated man, the new creation. This does not apply to the fallen man. It applied to Adam and Eve before they fell. But after the fall for a little while, 
man was ranked inferior, okay, to the angelic. When Christ is come, that order is restored because we are reconciled back to God. Okay, we are placed in a place even higher than Adam and Eve. So, the Bible says you put all things under him. But then he continues to say, but now we don't see all things under him. We don't see all things under him. We might not see all things under him. But we don't see that. In other words, there are things around the world that don't show, but are not yet evident that all things are under man. There are things that are not yet showing, that are not yet giving proof of that reality. There are things that are not yet expressing in form. For example, we believers are given power over the world. We have dominion over the world. We are supposed to subdue the world because it's in our nature and power and ordination to replenish and heal and restore the world. Yes, it's in our nature. But we are seeing a pandemic around us. We're seeing disease around us. We're seeing bondage around us. We're seeing troubled homes around us. We're seeing sick folk around us. There's probably somebody watching me right now. You are maybe suffering from cancer or HIV. Tonight God is going to heal you. Today is your answer, not tomorrow. Tonight is your answer. Tonight is your answer. It's your answer. Tonight is your answer. So I think, yes, what happens when we don't see yet all things put under him? What we do when we don't see yet all things put under him? What are we supposed to do? How are we supposed to react? How are we supposed to respond when we see things that provoke our nature as a new creation? Verses 9. He says, but we see Jesus. He says, but we see Jesus. We see Jesus. We see Jesus. We see Jesus. We don't see the statistics. We see Jesus. We don't see how bad it is. We see Jesus. That already is obvious to the world. But the Bible says in Hebrews 2.9, but we see Jesus. We don't see death. It doesn't mean that death is not happening across the world. It is happening. But it's not the central focus for the believer. Because if the believer continues to just see and recognize death, that believer is opening up to more death. But the Bible says, but we see Jesus. Yes, you're going through a trying time. But we see Jesus. Yes, your finances are crumbled. But we see Jesus. The rumblings of death are hidden on the doors every hour of the families and households across the world. But we see Jesus. People are under lockdown and quarantine. Yes, don't look at that quarantine. See Jesus. Look at him. There's song that says, look and leave. Look and leave. My brother, leave. Look to Jesus now. And leave. It's recorded in his word. Hallelujah. There's another song that says, Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of us will grow. In the light of his 
glory and praise. But now we see Jesus. Glory to God, we see Jesus. 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 We see him. We see him in the glory of his majesty. We see him in that power. We see him in that strength. We see him in that victory that he defeated the devil. He made a public spectacle of them all triumphing over all of them. Brothers, but we see Jesus. We see Jesus. Who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death? Why does the Bible say for the suffering of death? Before that experience of his wounding for our transgressions and bruising of our iniquities, the carrying of our sin, he was above the angelics. He was superior. To the angelics. He was ranked higher, the Son of God. But there was that hour of witness, that moment when Jesus took on our sins. He carried the burden in the likeness of a man in the form of a servant. And the Bible says he became obedient unto death, and even the death of the cross. And the next verse says, Wherefore, the Bible says, God has also highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow. He doesn't say, could or might bow. No, every knee should bow of things in heaven and of things in the earth and of the things under us. And every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Hallelujah. Now let's go back to Hebrews 2, verses 9. He says, But now we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned him with glory and honor, the Bible says, that he by the grace of God, should test death for every man. Every man. Praise God. And the next verse says, For it became him for whom are all things, and by him are all things, the Bible says, in bringing many sons unto glory, to make the captain of their salvation perfect through suffering. Isn't that the reason why Jesus suffered? He was made a little lower than the angelics. He came and carried our sins on the cross. When he became seen, he went down in rank. He became inferior to the angelics that had never seen. But why? That he will become all things for whom are all things and by whom are all things in bringing many sons to glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through suffering, the Bible says. And verses 11 now tells us, For both he that sanctifies and they who are sanctified, the Bible says, are all of one, for which cause he is not ashamed to call them brethren. At that particular hour, and the next verse, he told them, I will declare thy name unto my brethren in the midst of the church life sing praise. He said, I'm getting to their level. I'm getting to the level of fallen man. And verses 13 says, and again, I will put my trust in him. This is Jesus. And again, behold, I and the children which God has given me. This is Jesus speaking. Okay. For as much as then as the children, the Bible says, are partakers of flesh and blood, he also, the Bible says, himself likewise took part of the same. That was the only way. And that through, the Bible says, death, he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil. That was the only way Jesus would destroy Satan. He partook of flesh and blood. 
He took up the faith. Flesh and blood, the Bible says, cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Because that flesh and blood is of a fallen nature. So what does he do? He took on flesh and took on blood to get into the fallen nature, the rank lower, the man that had lost the power and authority to subdue, to have dominion, to replenish, to have control over things and the ages to come. He became that and went under that he might destroy the power of death. And I love verse 15. Verse 15 says, And to deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. Men had reason to fear death. They had reason to fear death. And because they had reason to fear death, they were all subject to death. Because they can do nothing in the world. They no longer have authority over the world. They no longer have dominion over the world. They don't have the glory to subdue it. They don't have the authority to subdue it. They cannot restore. They cannot replenish when the world goes out of line. The foundations are out of course and they have no power to restore. Prophets were sent in the fallen age, but they were only sent to point to one man, Christ. Isaiah was pointing to one man, Christ. Ezekiel, one man, Christ. Jeremiah, one man, Christ. Elijah, Elisha, the typification of how John the Baptist comes in the spirit of Elijah. Because there's an Elisha coming. And he's saying, one which is coming, I'm not worthy to untie even his lesson. Because he has a superior grace. Like we see Elisha elevated in the ranks of the anointing above Elijah. But it takes the humility of God. Oh, how can you even liken that to Christ? Can you believe that that Jesus, the Son of God, our Lord, even in that order, came in humility as a son of David? How can he be the son of David? He humbled himself. That's the mind which was in Christ. For he humbled himself. It even took him humility to be on that cross. Some people don't understand the humility of Christ. And because they don't understand the humility of Christ, it is so hard for them to reconcile the splendor and glory in the humility. That is why many people put a certain pomp of pride and ego around the anointing and glory. That's why some men of God dress a certain way, walk with certain things, because they don't know how to reconcile humility in splendor and glory. But the Son of God, Jesus Christ, set a perfect example. He was anointed, very anointed. But the Bible says, but the Son of God did not come to be served, but to serve. Wow. The Son of Man did not come to be ministered unto, but to minister, to give his life as a ransom. Yet he was all things, by whom were all things, through whom were all things. For nothing that was made that is made was made without him. Yet he humbled himself. It is great wisdom for a minister to flow in the fullness or in the overflow of the anointing of the person, the Holy Spirit, through Christ and still keep a certain humility before God. That is the wisdom that dwells on the Christ. But now, when we are anointed as men of God, some of them are even so hard to approach, so special to come near, so anointed to touch, so glorious to even communicate to. <laughs> wow. Wow. But, it is, but that is not how so you have learned Christ. That is not how so. You have learned Christ. There is a way we learn Christ. There is a way we learn of Christ. Although it's hidden from many men because religion and ideas and doctrines of men are filling our airways in the name of the doctrine of Christ. And now believers can't even discern depth. They don't even understand how heaven ranks men and his ministers. Today we celebrate the gift more than the wisdom of God. 
but that's for another day. So the Bible says in Hebrews 2.14, he says, when he partook of flesh and blood and took part of the same, through death he had and wanted and intended to destroy him that had the power of death, and that is Satan. And he did that. And, and he didn't only go to destroy Satan, which had the power of death, and, and the Bible says, deliver those who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. The message version of that in Hebrews 2 15, the Bible says, he freed all who cower through life scared to death. He freed all who cowers through life scared to death. The Amplified Version says he also that he might deliver and completely set free all those who through the haunting fear of death were held in bondage throughout the whole course of their lives. That means a believer is not supposed to fear, more so death. Do not be afraid of Corona if you're a believer. Believe God that he will keep you through this season. And if you're there and you're a believer, and you've been affected by Corona, by COVID-19, claim this promise in God and say in the name of Jesus, I shall not die. I shall not die. We refuse to lose men to Corona. We refuse to lose men to COVID-19. Not in this nation, not in the world. We refuse it in the mighty name of Jesus. We refuse it. We refuse it. We refuse to lose our loved ones to disease. We refuse to die early. Our days on earth shall he fulfill. In the mighty name of Jesus. In the mighty name of Jesus. So he said, you are free. You are delivered from the haunting fear of death. Some people are haunted by death. Everywhere they're thinking, oh my God, I think I'm going to die. I think I'm going to die. Some of you imagine dying. Some of you think dying. Some of you dream dying. Some of you imagine your children dying. You imagine your family dying. You imagine your spouses dying. They call you at home and you think, oh my God, who has died? You're always in the fear of death. And some of it's not even the body. No, the death of your stuff. There are people who are in a perpetual life of worry that their business is going to die, that their careers are going to die, that their companies are going to die. Oh yes, even though they show signs of death, you're delivered from death, the spirit. Right from you as an individual, but everything around you. What a glory. What a revelation. What a reality. Simply to know but Apostle, this died, that died. Now you know the truth. The Bible says, you are my disciples if you continue in the truth. He says, if you continue in the truth, you're my disciples. If you continue in the truth. And he says, and you shall know the truth. <laughs> and the truth shall make you free. But before that, in the verses before, he tells you that those which believe on him, he says, if you continue in my word, then are ye my disciples. If you continue, when people say you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free, he's not just talking about people who get revelations in the time when they need to get revelations to go through the trying hour. Uh-uh. He's talking about people who are attuned to reading the word constantly. If you read in the Amplified Version, he says, and Jesus said to those Jews who had believed in him, now he's talking to believers, not unbelievers. If you abide in my word, hold fast to my teachings and live in accordance with them. He says, if you continue to live in accordance with them, not just borrowing them when you need them. Some people read the Bible when they're in trouble. No. He says, you are truly my disciples. And as you continue to abide, to stay present in my word, he says, you will know the truth and the truth will make you free. Truth is not known because you read a verse of scripture that day. No. Truth is known by men who are in a continuous life of acquaintance to the word. That's why the KJV says, if you continue in my word, if you continue in my word, then you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. 
So freedom is not for men who just get verses. Oh, Isaiah this. Oh, Psalms 90. Oh, this. Because there are people who know how to respond in anxiety and fear. And then they open their Bibles because they're anxious. Oh, what should I read? The Lord is great in Zion. Oh, Psalms. I claim Psalms this. I claim Psalms that. Oh, I claim this. God, you say. Then they go on the internet. And then they Google healing scriptures. And then they claim them. And then they go on the internet. They look for provisional scriptures. Or they go through the Y and start to look for provision. Where do I find provision? How can I find an exhortation that will help align me into provision? Oh my God, provision. Oh, I think I need provision. I think now I need to get into the Y. No, 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 no. Such men cannot be free because they do not have a perpetual life of abiding in the Word, of continuing in the Word, of living in the Word. The Christian was called to live in the Word. We are not called just to read it when we can. No, we were called to live in the Word. We were called to live in the Word. I live in the Word. I have the Bible in my car, I have the Bible on my phone, I have the Bible on my tablet, I have the Bible in my bedroom, I have the Bible in the living room, I have the Bible everywhere. It's everywhere. I'm reading the Bible everywhere. I even have an audio one in my car. I have the Bible everywhere. Because I'm supposed to live in the Word. I'm not supposed to read it because I need to get a sermon. Oh, let me see what I'm going to preach tomorrow. Oh, no, no. No, no. I live in the Word. I have hundreds and hundreds of written sermons that have not yet preached. They are just there, seated, waiting for the opportune moment when God allows me to preach them. Because I live in the Word. I live in the Word. And sometimes I look through, and the Spirit tells me, uh uh, this is not for this time. This is for next year. This is for four years to come. I have stuff already written in my spirit. And some even on my notes that I'm to preach three or four years to come or five years to come. Because I live in the Word. I've lived in it. It's me. I breathe in it. So he said, if you continue in my Word, if you continue in my Word, he said, then are ye my disciples indeed. And he said, and ye shall know the truth and the truth that makes you free. We're talking about the truth that makes you free. We're not talking about just the truth that causes you to boast around. Hey, hey, I know the word. There are many men of God who speak the word but bring a deaf ear. Bring a tumor to them. Bring cancer to them. They're still loafing in poverty. They are rambling in luck. They're complaining. They're whining before God. They don't have results. Oh, but they quote scriptures. Why? Because they only read it to preach it. And so the gift in their life, yeah, yeah, you're gifted. But there's a difference between a man who reads the word to speak it and a man who reads the word because they live in it. That is a man that finds the truth that sets free. There are men who are speaking truth. But even the truths they're speaking can't fix their lives. They can't fix their children. They can't fix their marriages. They can't fix their finances. They can't fix their ministries. They don't live in it. They don't continue in it. They borrow it. They learn to teach it. They don't live in it. They just learn to teach it. They don't live in it. When you learn to read and live in this word, everything you read will start to create freedom around your life. Be a lover of the word. Some people think that they're going to go beyond it and survive in the giftings of men of God. Oh, what if? Yes, God has anointed me to heal the sick. That Everybody who has followed this ministry knows that. But God has not called you to live by my faith. There are prophets in the world, but God has not called you to live by prophetic utterance. But you're not supposed to live by my prophetic. No. The Bible says that he sent his word. 
the just, the Bible says, the just are preserved through knowledge. Through knowledge. Through knowledge. He says, shall the just be preserved. We are preserved through this word. So that is why I'm telling people, even when you're isolating and quarantining and in lockdown, live in the word. Live in the word. Live in the word. The Bible says in Psalms 115, verse 16, the Bible says he has given the earth to the children of men. He has given it. Fields, you're in charge. Subdue it. Control it. Replenish it. That is how Christians are supposed to be praying. That's the realm in which we are supposed to be praying. We're supposed to be praying in the realm of dominion over the earth of authority over the earth, of those who know that we have the glory, authority, and power to replenish the earth. We're not victims, God help us. No, we're not, God help us. No, we're telling the world, get in order. Foundations of the world, be aligned. Coronavirus, flee out of the earth. COVID-19, you are cast. It's our responsibility to restore the earth. Because we are believers. We are believers. But not only this is. This is the authority that speaks to your business. When the earth is not severing your creation. This is the authority that speaks into your family. This is the authority that speaks to your boy that is on alcohol right now. This is the authority that speaks into the spirit of your spouse when they're running out of order. This is the authority that speaks to your affairs of this life. This is the authority that speaks to nations. This is the authority that speaks to everything that touches life and existence. It ordains places in the spirit, times of the spirit, divine order. All of these things are subject to that authority. Now, what a good news that he has subjected the worlds to come under believers. That means the world is trying to do whatever they can scientifically, and that's okay. But we as believers have an authority, have a glory, have a power embedded in our spirits, given us by that reconciliation Lord God. He said, greater is he which is in you than he that is in the world. God told me the reason why we see this pandemic thrive, the church is not exercised in this understanding. And many believers are praying like victims. They are not resting. They are afraid. Uh-uh. Uh-uh. Uh-uh, be not afraid, be not afraid, be not afraid, be not afraid, don't be afraid, don't be afraid. And so because of that then, church is reacting instead of being proactive. The world is looking for answers, but we're also like the world, we're frail and mumbling in fear. Uh-uh. Let's give the world the answers. Jesus. Let's give the world the answers. The word. The word. What people are looking for right now is men who can make prayers and COVID starts to disappear out of men's bodies. While we are watching, while they are praying. Live. That's why I say these few Thursdays as COVID is still around. If you have any COVID case, Tell them to tune in. If you have any coronavirus case, tell them to tune in. We are going to prove to the world once and for all that Jesus heals diseases men can't heal. To the glory of God. I feel it in my spirit. And you believe as well right now listening in. You will not bury your own. Believe it. We want to come out of this situation, this season, 
when they are asking us questions so we can start answering and questions that are saying how did you do it how did this person heal as they tuned in how was this person delivered they were on a ventilator but when they showed them your video they were healed how was that done and then we opened the bible we show them the jesus we see to the glory of god remember that life will still continue it continues and so i want to pray with you right now i want you to raise your voice right now as one which has authority over the earth in the world to come next week you have authority for what's going to happen tomorrow in the news you have authority for what's going to happen next week and next month oh the world might not believe you but it doesn't matter god believes you and his word has given you that power father in the name of jesus we decree and we declare that covid-19 is a curse that pandemic is a curse from the world corona is a curse from the world any sort of disease is a curse from the world you give us in the mighty name of jesus poverty is far from our ears far ages in the name of jesus disease is far from you in the name of jesus bondage is far from you in the name of jesus see it far from us in the name of jesus our careers will not die our relationships will not die our friendships will not die those that are of god our connections will not die our ministries will not die in the mighty name of jesus we decree and we declare that the world is coming in order Miracles are happening across the world as men are being healed right now. Men on ventilators are receiving life and they're going to go off. I decree that we're entering a season where we're going to see more recoveries in COVID than we have seen in the past weeks. In the name of Jesus. Healing is taking place right now in the name of Jesus. In those hospital beds from Europe to the United States through Africa right now they're happening in Uganda across they are happening right now in the name of Jesus believe just believe believe that it is happening right now he says you shall decree a thing and it shall be established we decree that it is so death is a curse in the world fear is cast in the world in the name of Jesus your family is a blessed your ministry is a blessed your children are blessed The church of Jesus Christ is on top of this. Not under it, not through it. We are on top of it. In Jesus name we have prayed and believe. Amen. Glory to God. And if you're there and you've never given your life to Christ, right this very hour, I have explained why Jesus came. He came to deliver you from bondage, from fear. He carried your sins that you might become the righteousness of God that you might be restored to where you are supposed to be and above even Adam and Eve. And so I want you to repeat this word after me. Say Lord Jesus, I receive in my heart as one which died for my sins and was raised for my glory. and i confess you as lord over my life amen the message you have just heard was brought to you by sanero ministries international for more information contact us on telephone number 0414664291 4691 or email us at sanerokampala at gmail.com you can also find us on the web at www.sanero.org or better still feel free to join us every thursday for our weekly fellowship at uma multipurpose hall from 5 pm to 8 pm you can also catch the live stream at livestream.com/fenero fenero make manifest